I want to dive in, go back to the basic, talk about some of the keywords and terminologies, which I really believe is super important. So we have here is the good old enthalpy diagram, molar diagram, pH log diagram. It's called differently. People use different terms for it. And the importance of this, when I was starting out in the field as a service technician or was going to school as an apprentice, I've seen, I'm sure I've seen this. I don't remember us spending a lot of time on it because a lot of people, oh, that's more of engineering side. That's more for designers. That is not true. If you're a technician, it is so important to understand this diagram because this is how you understand all the different refrigerants out there. So as we can see right here, this is called, some people call this the bell curve. This is the saturated line. First step is understanding what's on the left side of it. So if you're looking at a diagram on the left side, saturated liquid or the bubble point. So that's very, very important to understand because as that refrigerant transitions to different states, it's going to be important to know where you're at on this diagram. The next one is the saturated vapor point. This is so, so important, not only for CO2, but for other refrigerants. Like when we get into glide refrigerants, you know, that is something really important. I know I talked to so many manufacturers who started to tell me like, Trevor, I'm working with 407 F or A. We know that refrigerant is starting to go away if it's not already uh, phased down, but there's, you know, 10, 12, 15 degree glide in some of these refrigerants. And it's like to design like an SST uh, and design a coil for that is very difficult. For CO2, it's not that difficult, a single blend. Uh, you want to understand what that dew point is or the vapor point. So, Because we always want to make sure that we have vapor going back to those CO2 compressors. The booster compressors or the transcritical compressors, we want to make sure that we always have a specific amount to surf superheat. So this is why we need to understand the saturated vapor point or the dew point. As we continue to move on, we wanna understand what's in the middle here. So this is no different than HFC refrigerant. This is your receiver on your CO2 system. This is the receiver. And this is where you have two phases or liquid and vapor mixture. So when we talk about that flash tank, that receiver, that vessel, you should have liquid and you should have vapor in there. There's going to be those two-phase liquid. And depending on where you come through that high-pressure valve um, on the, the, P, uh, the enthalpy diagram will depend on how much liquid and vapor percentage is coming through the high-pressure valve. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. On the left side of the log diagram, we have what we call subcooled liquid. So anything past this saturated uh, bubble point, saturated liquid line, will mean that we're subcooled. And the further we go is the more subcooling we have. We know a lot of controllers, when you're designing a system, you have to design for a certain uh, subcooling when we're in the subcritical application. So it could be three to five K, it could be six to seven degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, it all depends on the, the design. You don't want the subcooling to be too high when you're in subcritical you do not want it to be too low. So there's a happy medium there. And understanding where to plot that on this diagram is super important for anyone that's working in CO2 or any refrigeration system, to be honest with you. And there, as we continue to move along um, the system, we have the gas and vapor side. So I've talked with engineers, they drew lines for me. Oh, well, this is actually gas. This is actually vapor. For me, I call it gas vapor. That's why I got it in there as gas and vapor on the right-hand side past that dew point or a saturated vapor. Because this is very important to understand is we need to understand as that compressor takes in the vapor and it compresses that CO2 vapor and then discharges it out, it's all on the right side. There's heat of compression. Uh, as that heat of compression, it will change or move along these different lines here. These red lines that go across here, these are heat lines that come down. And there's actually a corresponding temperature down below. As we go through it down here, as we can see them all that go down, there's this corresponding temperature. So as that compressor, so that CO2 compressor compresses that refrigerant, it's going to have the heat of compression and it's going to take it up along here 
to change that temperature. And when you're plotting this, like you can go into your system that you're working on now. So if you're a technician in the field and you go up to that controller that's on that rack or that parallel system, you can actually plot that information on here. So you really understand what is the state of that CO2. Is it vapor? Is it liquid? Is it a two-phased uh, mixture? Or is it super critical? And we'll talk about that in a second. Down here on th these lines inside the bell curve. Some people use the bell curve uh, analogy. So inside these, there, th there's these lines here. And these are called the flash gas line, the percentage of flash gas line. This is really important for us to understand, is to understand how, many, how much uh, flash gas is in that receiver. We, we want to know. Or how much flash gas is coming out of that high pressure valve coming down the drop leg from the condenser. This is super important because this is going to tell us how that system is running. Uh, a lot of the times in the, the CO2 programs that I'm doing and the training technician is like, well, why do I really need to understand that? Well, it's important to understand because in the summer, you're going to have a different amount of flash gas versus the winter. That's going to change the dynamics of the system. It's going to change how many compressors you're going to need to be running at a time to really pull the heat out of that product to really maintain that right suction uh, pressures and temperatures. So it's so, so important. And it's gonna tell you how much work is gonna be need to be done for that system. Cause I know I work with a lot of companies that do like energy optimization. And it's important to understand like each, each kilowatt being used, what, what's the cause and effect. And it's important as a technician to understand, well, I'm getting way too much flash gas. This is no different than working on an HFC system and in your liquid line, you're getting flash gas. Um, that's the way I think of it is because the more flash gas you have, the more energy uh, penalty or tax that you're going to use because you do need to digest that through uh, a means. It could be through a parallel compressor. It could be through the medium temp transcritical compressor. There's different options of it, but you want to understand. And this line right here, as we hit, it might be hard for some of you to see, but it says 0.4. So that means there's 40% flash gas right about here. So there's 60% liquid. But as we start to move along here and we get closer to that saturated vapor line, like this line right here, would be 90% flash gas if we land it right about here and as we go all the way down here this would be 10 percent uh, flash gas or vapor in that two-phase mixture and then the top of it all is the critical point critical point this is a, a term that most people know but what what does it mean the critical point is when you're above that it's the co2 is an undefined fluid or any refrigerant, it's an undefined fluid when we're above that because all refrigerants will have a critical point. And it's important to understand because I didn't, I didn't even know that because our temperature, ambient temperatures don't get that high. But with CO2 at 87.8 or 31, uh, some people 31 degrees Celsius, 31.1 degrees Celsius, that is that temperature line, the critical temperature. But we also have a critical pressure line. So you need to be above both of these. When you're above both of these, that's when you are in super critical or your system's in trans critical. One of the things that I learned uh, maybe after about six or seven years of training CO2, because I've been training CO2 since 2015, and maybe even longer, longer than that. Well, no, 2015 I started training, but I learned this about CO2. If you're not above both the critical pressure and critical temperature, you're not going to be in super critical. We will be in this zone here, which is a compressed liquid. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But if we're above both of these, the critical temperature, the critical pressure, we are going to be a supercritical fluid. And the critical pressure is 1,055 PSIG or 72.8 bar. And so when we are there, when it's really hot outside, in the middle of the summer, those pressures in that gas cooler at this time are really high. We're a super critical fluid. And really, what does that mean? It means that it's an undefined fluid. There's no pressure temperature relationship. There is a percentage of liquid and vapor in that fluid. 
There are theoretical calculators for that inside the manufacturer's controller. So when we're running that high, what, what is it doing? It's calculating in these high pressure controllers, the best coefficient of performance is trying to maintain the least amount of flash gas or the not no i shouldn't even say the least amount of flash gas the best amount of flash gas going into that receiver to maintain to the amount of work for those transcritical compressors or the parallel compressor depending on the the system so that's really what it, what it's doing inside that high pressure valve controller it's going to be like oh let's move the pressure up or move it down to kind of maintain the best net refrigeration effect that you can get for that system on that particular those particular conditions and when we move over to the the left side of the te a critical temperature but we're above the critical pressure like i talked about already this is compressed liquid. And where did I learn learn about this? Well, really, I was, I was chatting with my friend, uh, good friend, James Seabrook. He owns a company called Vitalis, and they uh, build CO2 extraction machines. And I'm like, okay, then you go check that uh, podcast out, great podcast. But he, he was like, Trevor, if you're below that critical temperature, but you're above that pressure, it's, you, you know, it's a, it's a liquid still. And that really means that uh, you're not the supercritical fluid or the undefined fluid. That means that you can extract out of different products uh, using CO2 liquid. Uh, and I was uh, sitting with my, and really actually where I, I got the compressed liquid, called the compressed liquid, was from my friend Nabil Cook. He's part of the 12-week design course. This guy's a, an expert. And so I highly recommend if you haven't been into the 12-week design or you know anyone that that is looking to design transcritical systems. This guy's a game changer uh, for knowledge on designing systems. But he was like, Trevor, that is a compressed liquid. And then I put the two, two together. It's like, because we don't see that in refrigeration. We don't see, uh, you know, above the critical per pressure really and below the critical temperature. Um, but if you're ever in that state, it would be, if you're ever in this zone right here, it would be a compressed liquid. So these are some of the important things in keywords. So we got the uh, supercritical fluid, we got critical point, we got critical temperature and pressures, we got uh, saturated uh, vapor, saturated liquid. Really, none of these are new terms, uh, probably besides like maybe the critical point and maybe a supercritical fluid. But if you've been in CO2 for any length of time, you've probably heard those terms before. The other term that's really important to understand will be dry ice or hearing about um, dry ice. Can dry ice happen? It can happen in a system, but it's very rare that happen. Where I would see it the most is on the safety side is in gauges when someone's charging. So if someone never charged CO2, but they charged a lot of refrigeration HFC system, they got to really understand what is happening. When you're below that 61 PSI or 4.2 bar, I think it is, when you're below that and you try to charge with liquid will say it will cause dry ice and that's something to understand because that is a safety factor inside a system though our pressures are always above our pressures are always above that triple point it's called to create dry ice and so when we're above the triple point we don't have to worry about dry ice so when you got a system up and running you're not going to worry about that there are a few cases where you will worry about that uh, for example, if you're doing a liquid line filter change, you want to make sure that you properly pump that out. You have your gauges set up. You also have that set up to maybe uh, after all the liquids out, you have that set up to the low temp suction. And then you slowly feed that in there till you get down to low temp suction pressure, which is could be around, let's say, 200 PSI or you know 14 15 bar just making sure maybe not even that high but making sure you get to that suction vapor we know we got no liquid in there now we can open up that after we release the pressure down to atmosphere now we can open that up so there are situations where i talk with technicians in the our training program say hey trevor i had a situation where we had a, a liquid ball valve uh, uh leaking by there was no isolations anywhere uh, and so we had to open it up and it caused some dry ice in there. It happens. I've had other technicians in the program. They said, listen, I'll, I'll get some pictures for dry ice 
uh, for you, they actually had to make ca cause it, create dry ice in the system. Does it happen? It can happen, but it's not something as a technician that you really need to worry about. And even as a designer, you don't, it's not something that you worry about because our pressure, the, those low temp pressure, suction pressure will be the lowest in the system. And they're always quite high above it. But when you're charging or adding gas, that is something that needs to be a concern. And as, if a technician is shown once, it, it'll, it'll stick with them. Um, but it is important to understand how it happens. Okay. I've seen systems be charged from uh, evacuation with liquid cylinders. It takes time though. You know, you got to slowly bleed it in. You're flashing it through the valve, but you got to understand what you're doing. Okay. That's why you always charge systems with vapor up to a hundred PSI or seven bar or hundred, uh, 145 PSI, 10 bar, whatever it is, get the vapor in there. And then you get the liquid in, then you charge super fast. I've, I've talked with uh, uh, manufacturer rep charging like 15,000 pounds in a couple hours into a large system. So you can get it in there pretty quick. Um, the big, big step is, is doing all the pre-work for all that. 